Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center. Brett, would you like to introduce yourself? I am Brett. Uh, I'm a student intern at the Blum Center this spring semester. And before we begin, just wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you're in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that you can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time from the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'd be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. All right, so next I am gonna turn it over to Brett, who will introduce you all to today's guest speaker. So presenting for us today is Dr. Brian Edlow. Dr. Edlow is a neurocritical care doctor at Mass General an associate professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. He directs the lab of neuroimaging of coma and consciousness and is associate director of the Center of Neurotechnology and Neuro Recovery. Dr. Edlow is the recipient of the 2019 NIH Director's New Innovator Award and serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Neurocritical Care Society's Curing Coma Campaign. In recognition, in recognition of Brain Injury Awareness Month, he joins us today to give a talk on recovery of consciousness in patients with severe brain injury. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Edlow. Thank you so much, Brett and Amy, for your kind introduction. It's an honor to be able to give this talk, especially for Brain Injury Awareness Month. I'll just take a moment to share my slides. Hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint. So the title of today's talk is Predicting and Promoting Recovery of Consciousness After Severe TBI. Some of the work that I'll be describing was funded by a variety of federal foundation and departmental sources, and I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. There are five objectives for today's talk. First, we'll discuss the clinical motivation for the development of advanced imaging and electrophysiologic techniques aimed at detecting signs of consciousness in the ICU. Second, the state of the science in this field. Third, some initial clinical applications of these tools. Fourth, we'll be discussing how these tools are being used to guide the selection of targeted therapies aimed at promoting recovery of consciousness. And finally, I'll be proposing to you that a network-based autopsy of the human brain has a critical role to play in elucidating mechanisms of recovery from disorders of consciousness. The motivation for this work that's being performed in our lab at MGH and many other labs around the world is to improve acute care and long-term outcomes for patients with severe brain injuries. Now, I put an asterisk here because just as COVID has affected every other aspect of our lives over the last few years, many labs, including ours, have applied these, some of these techniques to patients with disorders of consciousness related to COVID-19. And I'll be sharing some of those data with you later in the talk. We also aim to support families who face a fork in the road, life or death decision, typically within the first seven to 10 days of their loved one's admission to the ICU. Do we continue with life-sustaining therapy, which involves placement of a tracheostomy and a feeding tube? Or if even the best case scenario for a long-term recovery involves a quality of life that would be unacceptable to that patient, then do we transition to comfort-focused care and allow that patient to pass away in the ICU? The problem that we face is that our diagnostic tools often fail to detect the preserved brain networks that could support long-term recovery. Similarly, our prognostic tools fail to reliably predict outcomes. And so I begin and end every family meeting in the ICU with a message of humility and an acknowledgement that prognostication in the ICU is an uncertain art and science. The literature teaches us that many ICU clinicians have a more pessimistic approach to prognostication. This prognostic pessimism is evidenced by the largest study to date looking at causes of death for patients with severe traumatic brain injury in the intensive care unit. This is a study out of Canada, six level one trauma centers, over 600 patients with severe TBI, and the investigators found 
that 70% of all deaths in this population were attributable to withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy. So were all of these patients destined to have a poor outcome anyway? Well, about half had an unreactive pupil, about a quarter had evidence of herniation on CT, two of the findings we typically associate with a poor prognosis. And what emerges when you read the discussion of this paper is that it is the manner in which we, the clinicians, are communicating with families that is the primary determinant of decisions to withdraw life-sustaining therapy. What about in patients with cardiac arrest? This is a study of over 4,000 patients, over 150 hospitals. And on the x-axis, we're looking at the day of death after cardiac arrest. On the y-axis, the number of patients who died each day. And what we see is that the purple bars, which represent withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy based on the neurologic prognosis, these purple bars are the highest, the number one cause of death every day. Again, in this study, they found a lot of variability in decision-making across hospitals, suggesting that we, the clinicians, are playing a large role in driving family decision-making. And what I thought was most compelling about this study was that the investigators developed a prognostic model to predict who would recover and what their functional, uh, their level of function would be at hospital discharge. And they then applied that model to those patients who had withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy. What they found is that about a quarter of the group who had withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy would have survived a hospital discharge, and 16% of them would have had a modified ranking score of three or less, which means walking independently, not at six months, not at one year after the injury, but at hospital discharge. These are humbling statistics for those of us who prognosticate in the ICU. So let's be clear about the stakes of an incorrect prognosis. If we are overly pessimistic, then a patient who had the potential for a meaningful recovery could have life-sustaining therapy withdrawn prematurely in the ICU. On the other hand, if we are overly optimistic, then a patient could end up in a vegetative or minimally conscious state that he or she would never have found to be acceptable. So for the next 45 minutes, we're gonna be talking about some advanced technologies, imaging and electrophysiologic, that are being applied to improve the accuracy of our diagnoses, such as by detecting this phenomenon of covert consciousness, how they're being applied to improve the accuracy of our prognostication by mapping structural and functional brain networks, and also how they're being applied to guard, to guide the selection of targeted therapies. First, diagnosis. Many of us are familiar with the Glasgow Coma Scale, or the GCS, which is used around the world. It was developed in the 1970s, the most commonly used behavioral assessment technique at the bedside in the emergency department or in the ICU for patients with severe brain injuries. And this is a rapid assessment technique. It should be performed in 30 to 60 seconds, and it helps to guide decision-making with regard to placement of an intracranial pressure monitor, like this patient has in the illustration, or which patient needs to be crashed to the operating room to have a decompressive craniectomy. These are the types of decisions that can be informed by a rapid assessment with the GCS. Now, let's say those of us on this Zoom right now, the clinicians who are listening to this lecture, we all walk into an ICU room today and we perform this type of assessment for a patient and we come out and say, you know, the patient's eyes were open, but they didn't show any evidence of awareness of self or environment. It looks like they're in a vegetative state, which is defined as being awake, but not aware. Now let's say we go back in the room and we do a more comprehensive behavioral assessment with the Coma Recovery Scale Revised, or the CRSR, which is standard of care in the rehabilitation setting, but is rarely done in the ICU because it can take upwards of 30 to 45 minutes. And often we don't have, not that we as clinicians don't have the time to do it, but that the patients can't tolerate being off of sedation for that long without being uncomfortable or in pain or having elevations in their intracranial pressure or blood pressure. So there are feasibility constraints around doing this type of assessment. But let's say the patient can tolerate being off of sedation for 30 to 45 minutes, and we perform this comprehensive behavioral assessment. Multiple studies have now shown that about 40% of the time, we will detect subtle evidence of consciousness. And often it's because of the use of additional assessment techniques, like using a mirror to assess for gaze tracking as shown here. Now let's imagine that every one of these patients could undergo a task-based functional MRI assessment using motor imagery, where we place earphones in the ears 
as shown here in the illustration, and we ask the patient to imagine that they are performing a task, like imagine opening and closing your hand. Multiple studies by our group and others around the world have shown that even in patients who had the CRSR, the comprehensive assessment, even in those patients, if they appear unresponsive on their behavioral exam, 15 to 20% of them will appear conscious and will volitionally modulate their brain activity during the fMRI. So what do we call these patients? What is the diagnosis? The most commonly used term is covert consciousness. Another term proposed by Nico Schiff in 2015 is cognitive motor dissociation. The idea that there's a dissociation between a high level of cognition and a low level of motoric expression. And what I'd like to share with you on this next slide are some preliminary data that we acquired at Mass General Hospital as part of a pilot study conducted between 2012 and 2014 in our neuro ICU. We, we acquired both fMRI and EEG data, but for the purpose of this slide, we're gonna be focusing on the fMRI data. The first row is a healthy subject. In addition to the motor imagery task, we also played spoken language and we played music to look at each subject's passive responses in their brains to these stimuli. So to the language and music stimuli in a healthy subject, what we see are responses within the superior temporal gyri bilaterally. And during the motor imagery task, we see responses in the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortices, right out of the textbook, just what we'd expect. The next patient had just recovered the ability to follow commands on the bedside behavioral exam, which means he was in a high level minimally conscious state, which is referred to as MCS plus. And when we did the fMRI, we see responses during language and music. And although the response to motor imagery is less robust, we also see activation in the SMA and the premotor cortex. The fMRI results are consistent with the bedside behavioral exam. We have not learned anything new from fMRI. The next patient, however, is a young woman who was an unhelmeted motorcyclist. She crashed into a wall. And on the day of her fMRI, her behavioral examination suggested a vegetative state, awake but unaware. Yet her, here are her responses to language and music, and here is her activation in the premotor cortex to the motor imagery task, evidence of covert consciousness. She goes on after a lengthy inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation to fully recover functional independence. The next patient's a young man who was a pedestrian hit in a crosswalk. He was scanned 25 hours after his injury, had just recovered the ability to localize to noxious stimulation. The examiner pinches him, he pushes the examiner's hand away. So some subtle evidence of awareness of the environment, the low level minimally conscious state or MCS minus. No evidence of language comprehension or expression on his bedside behavioral exam. Yet here are his responses to language and music they go outside of primary auditory cortex, Heschel's gyrus, into Wernicke's area, the association cortices. He does not respond to motor imagery, so he does not meet our criteria for covert consciousness, but I would argue that we have still learned something new here. For this patient who did not show signs of language function on behavioral exam, we see with fMRI that the language regions of the brain can respond appropriately to a stimulus. And those neurons may therefore provide the functional architecture for long-term recovery. And indeed, he goes on after a lengthy inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation to fully recover functional independence, and he rejoins the workforce. The last patient's a young woman who was an unseatbelted passenger in an SUV accident. On the day she was scanned in the ICU, her behavioral examination suggested a comatose state. She shows no response whatsoever to language, music, or motor imagery. Yet she too goes on after a lengthy inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation to recover functional independence, graduate from college, and rejoins the workforce. And I always end with this case to highlight the point that these advanced neurotechnologies, like any other diagnostic or prognostic technique we use in the ICU, they have fundamental limitations. The most important of which, in my opinion, is a high false negative rate. In fact, if all of us on this Zoom today were to undergo these tests, 25% of us, one quarter, would have this result on motor imagery, a negative result, either because we're not paying attention or we're not trying hard enough or we're all sleep deprived and we fell asleep in the scanner. In this young woman's case, she was also on a propofol drip for comfort and safety during the scan. That may have confounded the assessment. 
And so when we sit down with families to share these results, which we do have permission to do so from our local IRB, and I'll mention parenthetically that of the 80 or so patients whom we have enrolled in studies since 2012, every single family has requested access to this information. They want to know their loved one's results. So when we sit down with those families, we always explain that a negative result does not predict a poor outcome because of this high false negative rate. It's also important to point out that these are very challenging studies to perform from a logistical and a safety standpoint. Just the act of transferring a patient from an ICU bed to the MRI scanner table, as shown here, requires the expertise of neuro ICU nurses, respiratory therapists, MR technicians, and other experts on our team. And if any of the lines, tubes, or drains connected to this patient were to become dislodged during this process, that could become a serious safety issue for that patient. And so these logistical safety and safety issues have been a major motivation for the development of electrophysiologic techniques to detect covert consciousness. And what I'd like to share with you here are three of the most relevant findings over the last decade or so of electrophysiologic research in this field. The first is that 15 to 20% number again, the percentage of patients who appear unresponsive on their bedside behavioral examination don't show any evidence of language processing, but who will follow a command and volitionally modulate their brain activity during task-based EEG. The second finding is that covert consciousness appears to be more common in patients with traumatic etiologies of their brain injury as compared to non-traumatic. And finally, there is that 25% false negative rate again. Whether it's with task-based fMRI or with EEG, that is the percentage of healthy volunteers who show a negative result during a motor imagery task. So why does this matter? Why do we need to get it right in the ICU? In other words, is diagnosis relevant to prognosis? Let's take a step back and look at some natural recovery data from the late 1990s. This is a paper by Giacino and Kalmar, where they looked at 70 patients with severe traumatic brain injury. On the x-axis, we're looking at the number of months post-injury, and on the y-axis, at the mean disability rating scale score, where higher scores indicate worse disability. The blue bars represent those patients who were in a vegetative state when they got to inpatient rehabilitation, and the pink bars indicate those who were in a minimally conscious state when they got to inpatient rehab. Not surprisingly, both groups have high levels of disability at month one, but as we get out to the 12th month, one year post-injury, we see that these bars have dissociated such that those patients who were initially in a minimally conscious state have far less disability at one year post-injury. In fact, 10% of this group, these are patients who left the ICU in a minimally conscious state and were admitted to re inpatient rehabilitation with that level of profound disability and a disorder of consciousness, 10% of that group in MCS has zero measurable disability at one year. Again, humbling statistics for those of us who prognosticate in the ICU. So we've talked now about how overt behavioral signs of consciousness in the ICU may predict long-term recovery, but what about covert consciousness? A landmark study published by Jan Klassen and colleagues, a group at Columbia in New England Journal in 2019, used a task-based uh, imagery paradigm. Uh, they looked at the ability of healthy controls to follow this task as measured by EEG. That's what's shown here in orange. And they also looked at the ability of patients with severe brain injuries in the ICU to modulate their brain activity in response to a command. And that's what's being shown here in blue. What they found, again, that 15% number, that was the percentage of patients who had both traumatic and non-traumatic etiologies of, the brain, of their brain injury. That was the percent of their patients who could follow the command and showed signs of covert consciousness. And the key finding here was that the odds ratio for a favorable outcome at one year based on the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended the odds ratio was 4.6 for those who were covertly conscious in the ICU as compared to those who were not. The first evidence that covert consciousness may have similar prognostic relevance to overt consciousness in the ICU. Fast forward to 2020, a group in the UK in Birmingham puts out a paper using a very elegant language paradigm whereby they looked for EEG responses that were time locked to words as compared to phrases, as compared to sentences, as shown here for a representative control. And what they found 
was that EEG responses to this language paradigm explained 30% more variance in six month outcomes than did the patient's GCS scores in the ICU. The first evidence that this type of language paradigm could predict long-term recovery. Now, what do we call these patients? This is similar to the young man, the pedestrian in the crosswalk, whose brain lit up and responded to language with fMRI in our cohort. There is no agreed upon diagnostic label for this phenotype, for this phenomenon. Our group recently proposed the term covert cortical processing, but that uh, there's, there is certainly not a consensus agreement that that's the right term to use. And I'm uh, very curious to hear people's thoughts during the question and answer period, if people uh, can propose other uh, diagnostic classifications, because that gives you a sense of how fast this field is evolving. We don't even have agreed upon terminology yet for what we're observing in these studies. It has been remarkable to see the degree to which clinical guidelines are now embracing these advanced techniques. And the first such guideline to do so in 2018, I'll mention parenthetically, before the two studies I, I mentioned on the prior slide were published, this guideline that was endorsed by the American Academy of Neurology, the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, and a US institute, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, put out its clinical recommendations in 2018, which for the first time endorsed task-based EEG and task-based fMRI for the detection of covert consciousness. Now, to be fair, the level of confidence behind these recommendations was moderate and low, respectively. And it's also important to point out that these recommendations pertain to patients who are in the subacute to chronic phase of their recovery beyond 28 days. Nevertheless, the first time a clinical guideline endorsed these techniques. Fast forward to 2020, the European Academy of Neurology puts out its guideline, and they too endorse a multimodal approach. And I'd like to quote these authors because I think that their recommendations represent such a sea change in our field. They state that, quote, in conclusion, standardized clinical rating scales, EEG-based techniques, and functional neuroimaging should be integrated into a composite reference standard. This means that a given patient should be diagnosed with the highest level of consciousness as revealed by any of the three approaches. So this is the multimodal assessment paradigm that is now being recommended by the US and European guide guidelines. Comprehensive behavioral assessment with the CRSR whenever it's feasible to do so, as well as task-based EEG and fMRI when feasible. Many of us were trained to consider the assessment of consciousness as proceeding along two axes, those of overt cognition and motoric function. But we're now being asked to consider a third axis, that of covert cognition, as assessed with fMRI or EEG. So let's transition now to another advanced diagnostic technique that's been getting a lot of attention in our field, and that is structural connectivity imaging. This is a study that was performed by Dr. Sam Snyder, who was a neuro ICU with the fellow at the fellow at the time. He's now on the faculty uh, in the neuro ICU group at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And what Sam and our team did was to look at the same cohort from the pilot study whose fMRI results I showed you earlier, 16 patients with severe TBI admitted to the Mass General Hospital ICU. And we mapped structural connections between the brainstem tegmentum and the thalamus, hypothalamus, and basal forebrain to see if we could detect disruptions in this critically important network that has been shown in prior animal and human studies to be relevant for consciousness. What we found was that we could detect disruption of these pathways in patients as compared to age match controls, as shown from a sagittal perspective on top and an axial perspective on the bottom. And the orange voxels shown here represent areas of peak structural network disruption, with the white voxels indicating those that survive correction for multiple comparisons. In this video, we're going to be looking at horizontal sections of the brain from the mid pons up through the diencephalon, and the red regions of the brain indicate those that are normal structural connections in this critically important network for consciousness that we could detect in healthy controls, whereas the white voxels indicate those that were disrupted in the patients. And what we see in the patients is disruptions in the dorsolateral quadrant of the midbrain. We see these disruptions in the midline refae, and we see them tracking up into the central thalamus, consistent with prior pathologic studies in non-human primates and in humans.
What this means is that we can now see on a clinical scanner, these were all patients that were scanned on our standard three Tesla MRI scanner in the neuro ICU using a diffusion sequence that lasted nine minutes, about twice as long as a standard diffusion sequence. Nevertheless, uh, a feasible uh, duration of, of data acquisition. And this allowed us to detect disruption of a brain network that might be implicated in the pathogenesis of coma in these patients. Dr. Snyder and our team then looked at a longitudinal subset of those initial 16, nine came back for follow-up scanning. All nine had fully recovered consciousness when they returned at six months post-injury. And what we found was that there was a particular pathway between the brainstem tegmentum and the thalamus whose connectivity increased the most in the group level analysis between the ICU scan and the six month scan. But what we also observed was significant interpatient variability. So even for that brainstem to thalamus pathway as shown here, there was a lot of variability between patients with two of the nine having a decrease longitudinally in their connection between the connections between the brainstem and thalamus. And what this seems to suggest is that there may be multiple pathways, multiple mechanisms by which patients can recover consciousness after a severe brain injury. These observations are consistent with current conceptual models of consciousness, such as the information integration theory proposed by Giulio Tononi and colleagues at Wisconsin, whereby the idea is that there is no single node or connection in a network that is essential for consciousness. Rather, there are certain connectivity properties like specialization, which is connectivity between nearby nodes of a network, and integration, which is connectivity between long distance nodes. Only networks that have an appropriate balance of these connectivity properties, specialization and integration, may be able to generate the emergent property of consciousness. Our results are also consistent with prior animal studies showing that disruptions from a structural standpoint in a network can still be consistent with functional reorganization of a network, whether that's by altering a network's neurotransmitter expression profiles or the electrophysiologic signaling of that network. Let's now take a look at some of the resting state functional connectivity data that have emerged in this field and their potential promise for predicting outcomes. One of the first studies performed uh, by Audrey Van Houten, using colleagues in Liège, Belgium, in, this, uh, in the disorder of consciousness population, looked at a group that was in the subacute to chronic stages of their recovery. And what they found is that there did appear to be a particular node of the default mode network. This is the most widely studied cortical network that is believed to play a role in introspection and self-awareness. And there did appear to be a node in the posterior cingulate and precuneus whose connectivity with the rest of the default mode network distinguished those patients who were minimally conscious from those who were unconscious in a vegetative or comatose state. We then replicated this finding in that same ICU cohort from our pilot study at Mass General Hospital. This is a study that was led by Zach Threlkeld, who was a neuro ICU fellow at the time and is now on the faculty at Stanford, as well as Dr. Elena Bodine, who's also at Mass General Hospital. And what we found is that there was indeed an increase in connectivity between the posterior cingulate and precuneus, as well with other nodes of this network and the default mode network, as patients recovered from a comatose state to a minimally conscious state. But we also found increased connectivity with the inferior parietal lobules and the medial prefrontal cortex. It's important to point out that connectivity within the default mode network appears to be necessary, but not sufficient for recovery of consciousness. One of the first groups to observe this uh, published their findings in 2012 in a small cohort of patients with cardiac arrest, where they observed that all of the patients who ultimately recovered consciousness had at least a partially preserved default mode network while they were comatose. But some of the patients who had a partially preserved default mode network never recovered consciousness. And multiple subsequent studies, including this one by Athena de Merci and colleagues at Liège, Belgium, showed that there are numerous resting state functional networks whose connectivity increases as patients recover consciousness, as shown here. And the exact combinations or constellations of these networks that are most essential for recovery of consciousness is still an active area of investigation in our field. So we've talked now about the potential prognostic relevance of mapping functional networks in the ICU for predicting long-term recovery. 
And what I show here is a representative sample of the recent papers that have observed this association between functional connectivity in the ICU and long-term recovery. But I also want to acknowledge that the sample sizes of these studies are relatively small. In this, for this representative sample, they range from 13 to 112 patients. So we are nowhere close to where our colleagues in the fields of cardiology or oncology are, for example, with respect to the definitive studies in their fields, which have hundreds or thousands of patients. Nevertheless, some groups, including our own at Mass General Hospital, have begun to translate these techniques from the investigational domain into the clinical domain. And before I show you some of our results, I'd like to step back and consider some of the statistical issues here as we move into the clinical domain. First, many of us think of a blood test. We go to our doctor, we get our blood checked, and we have, a set, we have an inherent sense of what it means for our cholesterol, for example, to be out of range. Our value was compared to some reference control data set, and that's how the comparison is being made. But what is the, comparison da the comparative data set that we should be using for these types of analyses? The short answer is we're not sure yet. One of the groups that has been leading the way to answer this particular question is David Sharp's lab in the UK, where here's a study where they looked at over 100 patients with moderate to severe TBI. They were all in the subacute to chronic phase of the recovery. And they asked the question with structural connectivity imaging, diffusion MRI, how big of a control data set do we need to be able to reliably detect abnormal structural connectivity in the patients as compared to that reference control data set. And what they ultimately concluded was that, quote, a control sample size of around 30 with a range of ages provides acceptable specificity and sensitivity. Now, that may be true for their hospital and their scanner and their particular diffusion MRI sequence, but that might not be true for other scanners and other sequences. In other words, the hardware and the software differs from site to site, and those differences in hardware and software can affect our measurements. And so one of the questions right now is, will each center need to collect its own control cohort to which its patients will be compared? Is there some way we can leverage some of these massive data sets, such as those uh, collected by the Human uh, Connectome Project, and can we compare our individual patients to that large multi-site reference database? That's what we and others in the field are trying to explore right now to move this toward clinical translation. Let's also consider some ethical issues here. We have convened a patient and family advisory board to whom we are very grateful. We meet with them quarterly to ask for their feedback and guidance about how we can most ethically and responsibly move these techniques from the investigational domain into the clinical domain. Here are some of the papers that we published on some of the ethical considerations that we face in this work. And I'd also like to highlight here the work of Dr. Michael Young, who just finished up uh, an NIH Brain Initiative grant that was focused on understanding the ethical issues that we face as a field and in, in implementing these techniques. And I'd like to quote Michael here because I think this is such an important uh, perspective for us to consider moving forward. Michael states that given the ethical imperative of supporting those with emerging consciousness, how can we ensure that patients who stand to benefit from these neurotechnological innovations actually receive them? So with those statistical and ethical considerations in mind, I'd like to share with you now some representative clinical data acquired at MGH with these advanced techniques. This was a 47-year-old man who was admitted to our ICU during the initial stage of the COVID pandemic. This is the spring of 2019. Uh, this, or pardon me, this is the spring of 2020, uh, pre-vaccine. Um, this is when we were being flooded with many patients who were critically ill with acute severe COVID-19. And this patient was being assessed with respect to his long-term prognosis on day 41, as you can see here on this timeline. So the x-axis is the timeline, the, the hospital day shown here. And I'd like to share with you some of the clinical events that had happened to this patient prior to the time of our prognostication. When we look at his arterial oxygenation data, we can see that they intermittently fell below 60, which is our target uh, based on the ARDS-NEC guidelines, but he never had a respiratory arrest. His mean arterial pressure data intermittently fell below 65, our target based on the sepsis guidelines, but he never had a cardiac arrest. 
He was on a mechanical ventilator for over a month, received a variety of different paralytics and sedatives during that time. And by the time he came off the ventilator, about a month into his hospitalization, and by the time his sedation was weaned off, he still was not waking up. His behavioral exam fluctuated between a comatose, vegetative, and low-level minimally conscious state. And this was the scenario uh, during which we acquired these prognostic data on day 41. So here are his conventional standard MRI data. On the T2 flare, we see hyperintensities in the bilateral putamina and caudate heads, as well as the posterior thalami. We see some subtle diffusion restriction with hyperintense signal on the DWI and hypointense signal on the ADC. And on the resting EEG, we see a disorganized background with delta slowing. None of these conventional imaging or electrophysiologic data are particularly encouraging with respect to long-term prognosis. We added at the end of the conventional MRI scan, a 10 minute resting state fMRI sequence. Now at the time we were in the process of submitting a research protocol to study this population. And we ended up performing that investigation and publishing our results in neurology. But at the time this patient was in our ICU, that protocol had not been reviewed or approved yet. And so the only option for providing the family and the clinical team with this information was to do so for clinical care. Here is the default mode network template that we use. We looked at connectivity between the posterior cingulate, the inferior parietal lobules, and the medial prefrontal cortex. Here is a representative healthy control scanned on our neuro ICU scanner, just to give you a sense of how these data look visually. Here is a different patient with a disrupted default mode network, just to reassure you that our scanner does not detect a DMN in every patient. And here is our patient with severe COVID-19. I would argue that qualitatively and quantitatively, his DMN connectivity is indistinguishable from that of a healthy control. And with regard to the quantitative data, our control cohort is much larger now, and his DMN connectivity value remains squarely within the 95% confidence interval, the normative range for this test. And I should mention that this was work that was led by Dr. David Fisher, who was a neuro ICU fellow at the time and is now in the neuro ICU faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. So when we acquired these results, Dr. Fisher and I sat down with other members of the clinical team, as well as the patient's wife, who happened to be an ICU nurse at another institution. And we presented these results in the context of the broader prognostic picture. This was one of several different prognostic measures that was presented to the family. After a thoughtful discussion, she believed that her husband would want to continue with life-sustaining therapy. And 20 days later, on day 61, he began to reliably follow commands, to mouth words. And here he is one year later, a video that was taken on a Zoom uh, teleneurology visit with his permission. And this was ultimately published in Neurocritical Care. You can see him sitting up in bed. He's smiling. He's home with his wife. You can see that he's just celebrated a birthday. He's got strength in his arms. Now you'll notice he's on an air mattress. He had substantial lower extremity wasting, likely due to the long-term effects of ICU myoneuropathy. He was immobile for many weeks, but in his words, he was happy to be home, happy to be alive. We detected no cognitive deficits on our video-based exam, although he and his wife both acknowledged that there was perhaps some cognitive slowing they perceived that we couldn't pick up on our exam. Nevertheless, happy to be alive, happy to be home. So let's transition now to therapy. And maybe just to make one uh, final comment about the prognosis. Did the resting state fMRI results predict that one year recovery? I think we have to be cautious in any N of one analysis. We can't draw those types of conclusions or make those types of inferences. But did the fMRI result play an important role in that conversation? Did it help us to provide a more comprehensive picture of the long-term prognosis for his wife? My impression is that it may have, and it gives us a reason to consider using this in the future in a responsible way for clinical care. Transitioning now to therapy, how are these tests being used to inform the selection of therapies to promote, not just to predict, but to promote long-term recovery? We recently launched an intravenous methylphenidate study in the Mass General Hospital Neuro ICU, where we're testing the hypothesis that patients who have partially preserved connectivity between the dopaminergic ventral tegmental area and rostral sites in the thalamus, hypothalamus, basal forebrain, and cortex, these are the patients who are likely to respond to methylphenidate. 
because you need to have some axons intact, releasing dopamine at the synapse for this dopamine reuptake inhibitor to be efficacious. We are also partnering with a team at UCLA, led by Martin Monti, Caroline Schnakers, Paul Vespa, and colleagues, to test a therapy called LIFA, Low Intensity Focused Ultrasound Pulsation, where the hypothesis will be that patients with partially preserved connections between the central thalamus and the cortex, these are the patients who are likely to respond to this non-invasive stimulation of the central thalamus. We call this approach the connectome-based clinical trial platform. And this is a representative patient with severe TBI whom we predict would be a responder to methylphenidate. We're looking from a lateral perspective at fiber tracks that were generated using diffusion MRI data on our standard clinical at neuro ICU scanner. And what we see when we look at fiber tracks emanating from the ventral tegmental area is that there are far fewer tracks in the patient as compared to a control. But we also see that there are some preserved tracks in the patient and therefore, this is the type of person who we predict would respond to methylphenidate. So where do we go from here moving forward? How can we expand the landscape of therapies and inform the development of future therapies that promote recovery? Here, I'd like to propose to you the critical role of a network-based autopsy in moving our field forward. Since 2010, we have been partnering with families whose loved ones pass away in the ICU and asking for permission to donate their brains to a research study where we fix each of their brains in formalin for at least a month and then scan them for 72 hours continuously to acquire the highest resolution data we possibly can. The first 24 hours are on a seven Tesla at 200 micron resolution, which provides exquisite neuroanatomic detail like that shown here for the hippocampus and basis pontus. And then we then scan them for 48 hours for high resolution diffusion at 750 microns for diffusion co structural connectivity. We then section and stain each specimen, and we target our histopathological analyses to the well-established nodes of canonical neural networks, such as those shown here. This is part of a large collaboration that's been built over time, MGH Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Department of Defense, Mount Sinai, and the University of Washington are some of our partners in this effort. The conceptual framework here is that the post-mortem ex vivo MRI serves as a methodologic bridge that links gold standard observations made with histopathology to observations that are made pre-mortem with MRI, EEG, and the bedside behavioral examination. We certainly do not aim to replace the fundamentally important work that our colleagues in the pathology division are doing. Indeed, we are still performing standard stains of gray matter and white matter injury, but we are adding to those histopathological analyses measures of cortical thickness, for example, with FreeSurfer, a toolbox that was developed by Bruce Fischel and colleagues here at the MGH Martino Center, as well as diffusion tractography to further assess white matter connectivity. And the long-term goal of this work is to generate network models, such as the one shown here, that will provide quantitative measures to help us understand which network properties are most important for patients to recover to a certain level of consciousness before death. Here's an example of one of the first analyses uh, that we performed uh, using the network-based autopsy. This was a 53-year-old woman who fell down a flight of stairs and was comatose uh, in the Brigham and Women's ICU for three days prior to her death. And what we're seeing from a posterior perspective, looking at connections between the brainstem and the thalamus, is that compared to a control who has extensive connectivity between the brainstem and the thalamus, there is a near complete disconnection of this patient's brainstem from her thalamus as shown here in the connectogram schematic on the bottom of the slide. The idea is that one case at a time, we can learn which connections are most important for recovery. This is our imaging moonshot, the 100 micron MRI scan. This was acquired as part of a large collaboration with a team of engineers, physicists, and neuroscientists at the MGH Martino Center, several of which are shown here. So why do I show this in a talk about predicting and promoting recovery of consciousness? because pushing the limits of imaging acquisition, such as in this ex vivo MRI data set, which required 100 hours of continuous scanning, even our most dedicated volunteers cannot lie still for this long. So we may not see this level of resolution in our lifetime from an in vivo scan, but the ex vivo scan can help us to better understand the data that we're acquiring in living patients. And here are some examples of how we can make that work. 
This is an analysis that was performed by Dr. Andy Horn, who was at Charité University in Germany at the time, has since moved to the MGB community. Uh, he has now established a lab at, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is wonderful for the Boston community uh, because of Andy's leadership in this field. And what Dr. Horn did is a very rigorous set of co-registrations whereby he took this 100 micron MRI data set and brought it into a standard stereotactic space that everybody in the academic and clinical community has access to and can use. And what that means is that this 100 micron MRI data set has been integrated into Dr. Horn's freely available program, Lead DBS, as well as several similar programs. And we can use it to assess the targeting of our therapeutic interventions, such as in this video, where we're looking at the precise anatomic correlates of the placement of deep brain stimulation electrodes in a patient. If they're working in a particular patient or not working in another patient, how can the precise anatomic location of those DBS leads be better understood by superimposing them on our 100 micron MRI data set? Those are the types of questions that we're asking and initiatives that we're now pursuing. We can also use this data set to inform our understanding and our prediction of new targets. So this is work of a postdoctoral fellow in our lab, Dr. Andrew Lee, where what Andrew and our team did was to identify the highest resolution functional MRI data set that we could find. This was a seven Tesla data set over hundred subjects from the Human Connectome Project. And the question that we asked is, if we start with a cortical connectivity map of the default mode network, and then look for subcortical regions that are connected to the DMN, and superimpose that on the 100 micron MRI data set, can we identify new therapeutic stimulation targets? So what we're looking at here are the resting state fMRI data from Dr. Lee's analysis superimposed on the 100 micron MRI scan. The red yellow areas are those that are positively correlated or connected with the cortical nodes of the DMN. And the blue areas are those that are anti or negatively correlated. We see positive correlations in the ventral tegmental area in the lateral hypothalamus. We see them in the basal forebrain, in the central thalamus. And we also see this blue signal or anti-correlations in the basal ganglia. So let's think about this a little further. What might that mean? What is this blue signal in the putamen and the globus pallidus? Well, here we have to hearken back to the mesocircuit hypothesis for consciousness, a, a, a hypothesis that has gained a lot of traction in our field since it was proposed by Nico Schiff in 2010 because it appears to explain an otherwise paradoxical phenomenon, which is that 5% of patients with severe brain injuries will wake up and become more responsive when they receive a sleeping pill, a GABAergic medication like Zolpidem. And the same has been observed for GABAergic medications like benzodiazepines. So why is this and how does the hypothesis explain it? Well, the idea in the mesocircuit hypothesis is that there is a circuit between the striatum, the globus pallidus interna, and the central lateral nucleus of the thalamus that regulates cortical activity. And if this circuit has two GABAergic or inhibitory limbs, and if one of those two limbs has been disrupted by a brain injury, then perhaps these GABAergic meds are restoring the GABAergic signaling here and basically restoring the double negative, turning it back into a positive and thereby disinhibiting the central lateral nucleus of the thalamus and reactivating the cortex. That's the hypothesis for which there are some uh, initial data, both in primates and in humans, uh, supporting this idea. Now let's go back to our uh, fMRI data set. Here's this circuit from uh, Nico Schiff's hypothesis superimposed on our data. And it's important to acknowledge that we are looking here at millimeter level resolution of fMRI data which cannot be directly compared to, to micron level uh, signaling happening at the synaptic level. Nevertheless, are these millimeter resolution fMRI data giving us a surrogate marker, a biomarker of what's happening synaptically in this mesocircuit? That's a hypothesis that we name, now aim to test. And having these tools, the high resolution fMRI superimposed on the 100 micron MRI data set now gives us an opportunity to pursue new therapeutic interventions and to select patients in a more informed manner for those interventions. To conclude, what is our responsibility to patients and families moving forward? 
We've talked about how several academic institutions have now endorsed the use of advanced imaging and electrophysiologic techniques to in the care of this population, patients with disorders of consciousness. We've talked about how one US government institute has also endorsed these techniques. And it has been inspiring to see the degree to which leaders in our field, like neuroethicist Joe Finns, now speak about access to these techniques at international conferences as a civil right, akin to the Disability Rights Act approved by the United Nations in 2008. Now, there are profoundly important ethical considerations for us to consider as a community moving forward, and I look forward to having that conversation with you all in the question and answer period. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you'd like to learn more about the work that our lab is doing, here is a link to our website and our Twitter handle. And thank you again, and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Edlow. We are now towards the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. We had a question regarding an earlier slide. You had talked about MRI default mode network connectivity being associated with functional outcome after Carl cardiopulmonary arrest. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So thank you for the question. There are several different ways that functional outcomes can be measured. There's several scales that are commonly used um, and that have been validated over many years in our, in our field. Um, one of them is the disability rating scale. I mentioned that on some of the slides. Another is the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended. There is uh, the CPC, the Cerebral Performance Category. I hope I'm getting the acronym correct. Um, that's often used in the cardiac arrest population. So these are standardized scales um, that are used by many labs in our community, nationally and internationally, and allows us to compare results uh, across studies. And so whether those assessments are performed at hospital discharge three months, six months, or one year, that's often a judgment call based on the infrastructure and the resources that are available to a, a given investigational team. Um, there's also an interesting debate to be had about what's most important to families and to the individuals. And I think if you speak to families about this, the answer can differ. And it depends sometimes on the patient's age. In other words, how long would somebody be willing to tolerate a compromised quality of life in order to have the potential for a good outcome? Some families tell us that their loved ones would only want to go through a lengthy period of dependence for a month or three months. They wouldn't find it acceptable to do that for several years. Other, tell us, uh, other families tell us their loved one would be willing to undergo several months or even years of functional dependence and disability for the chance at a good outcome. So there's a lot of kind of interesting discussion and debate around when it's most appropriate to be assessing these outcomes. So I hope I uh, address the question. Yes, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about what a typical process of recovery after a brain injury looks like? It's a great question. And the short answer is that it's hard to do so because there's so much variability from person to person. And I'm not trying to dodge the question. There are certainly population data that can give us general estimates of what to expect as far as the recovery curves. But I'll try to speak from both anecdotal experience and more importantly, what the literature teaches us, and then also acknowledge some of the the variability along the way. So basic principles. People with a traumatic brain injury tend to recover more and for longer than people with a non-traumatic brain injury. That's been shown in several different studies. Now, there are, of course, exceptions to this, but I'm just speaking at the population level. As far as prognostic factors that have been shown time and time again to be relevant to long-term potential for recovery, age is one of the most important. Younger brains are better able to adapt and compensate. And this phenomenon of plasticity, which we still don't fully understand as a neuroscientific community, but the idea that the brain may be able to rewire after there's been an injury. So think of like a highway, there's a blockage on the highway, the signals are not getting through. And what happens when there's a blockage on the highway? We take a detour route. It's like your brain is building these detours to get around the blockage and the signaling. That process takes time and it appears to be more robust in younger brains than older brains. Again, we still don't fully understand why or how this is happening. Um, beyond that, there are certainly other prognostic factors. People who, who are more medically healthy and don't have other medical problems tend to do better than people who have a long list of other medical problems, high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic smokers, et cetera. But again, none of these are, 
None of these prognostic factors are hard and fast rules. There are certainly older patients who can kind of beat the odds and do well, and there are certain, certainly patients with medical comorbidities who end up doing well. I'm just kind of speaking in generalities now. Another generality is recovery tends to be most robust and fasted in, fastest in the first year. I was taught in med school not that long ago that recovery plateaued at one year. There is now definitive evidence showing that that is not true, especially in patients with traumatic brain injury. Recovery can continue to year, five, to year two, year five, and even to year 10 in the most recent studies. And I've seen this time and time again in clinic. We have a neuro recovery clinic here where we follow patients longitudinally and have seen patients make meaningful gains in cognition, physical function, et cetera, beyond one year. So these are some general principles, but each person's path and journey differs. There are many setbacks along the way. I think it's fair to say that almost nobody's journey is completely up. Everybody has some type of setback, or that, whether it's minor or major. And that's why it's important for us as clinicians to counsel families and patients once they recover consciousness about what to expect. And to, although it's a cliche, we often ask families and patients to think in terms of a marathon and not a sprint, because this really is a long-term process with many ups and downs along the way. And our goal is always to keep patients heading upwards so that they can have the best recovery possible. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Do neuropsychologists play a role in any way in recovery? If so, how so? It's a great question. So absolutely, neuropsychologists play a key role and are partners in this uh, recovery process. And it's probably important to highlight here how the, the type of care that enables optimal outcomes is inherently multidisciplinary. If you look at patients who live in environments that have those types of resources and access to inpatient, outpatient rehabilitation, Often it will be not a single provider, but a team that is providing them with care. And that team involves a lot of different sets of expertise because there's so many different issues to address. Neuropsychologists absolutely play a key role in that process at numerous stages of recovery. I'll highlight just one that I find to be particularly important in caring for this population, and that is return to work, return to school. And that's not to say that neuropsychology uh, care starts there, but it's a particularly important contribution that they made that they make because doing detailed cognitive testing, which really gets to the heart of what are the cognitive domains that are strong and which are still a challenge. Memory, attention, language, complex reasoning, you know, rapid um, shifting uh, of, of problem sets, speed. Uh, you know, processing speed, all of these different cognitive functions require, to really understand them, require detailed testing by a neuropsychologist. And I have seen time and time again, when somebody's getting ready to go back to school or to work, that the assessment performed by a neuropsychologist, and perhaps more importantly, the recommendations made by the neuropsychologist about how to play to one's strengths and to compensate or adapt for one's limitations, can make the difference between a successful return to school or work or an unsuccessful one. And, you know, even like recommending uh, a particular type of course, I've seen people's grades dramatically shift based on the recommendations of a neuropsychologist based on their cognitive testing uh, compared to grades that they got before that testing was done. So uh, again, that's just one of many ways they contribute, but uh, it, it's a very important one. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much for an informative session. Before we end today's session, are there any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Thank you for the opportunity. First of all, it's an honor to, to get to speak during Brain Aw uh, Injury Awareness Month. Um, and thank you, uh, Amy and Brett, again, for your kind introductions. I guess the final thought I would share is one of humility and the importance of clinicians acknowledging uncertainty when speaking with families. Um, are there situations where we can be pretty sure in our prognoses? Yes, that happens. There are situations where it's pretty cut and dry. Um, but those are rare. I, I think uncertainty is much more common, especially with patients with traumatic brain injury. And what I often will share with families is I'll, I'll, I'll go through the range of possible outcomes, talk about the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, the most likely scenario somewhere in the middle. And I'll acknowledge that the uncertainty in that range of outcomes is probably going to cause them some anxiety. And I apologize for that. But I'd rather 
be transparent and open with them about that uncertainty than say your loved one is going to look exactly like this in six months without really being sure. So it's, it's a very delicate balance, and it's really important that we communicate effectively and compassionately with families in these situations. But in my opinion, that uncertainty and humility is key to these conversations. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And for everyone who took the time to join us today, thank you so much. As I had mentioned, today's session is being recorded. If you're interested in the recording, maybe visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day.